The first scripture lesson today is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. So ends the first reading. Praise be to God. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Here ends the reading. Well, and you had heard it said that communists were bad. <laughs> that first church could have shared some notes with Karl Marx. The whole group of one heart and soul, not a needy person among them. What a community. You want to join? There's a condition. People drawn to inclusiveness enjoy using this word community. We call churches and synagogues and masjids communities of faith. We support or take part in the gay community, the black community, the disabilities community, and more. We respond to the vision of the beloved community made beautiful by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. 60, was it seven years ago, uh, on April 4, 1967, Reverend King was at the Riverside Church there in a speech called Beyond Vietnam. He thundered 
that we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values from a thing-oriented society to a person-centered society involving a transformation of the spirit and imagination in each and every citizen. What a vision. What a community. How are we doing? As a society, not well. Not well at all. Perhaps some of us overuse this word community to help mask our, our dismay, even our despair over the fractious and deadly disarray in this nation which once held democracy sacred, however poor was our performance. Maybe we're just too overwhelmed by the news. For over 40 years, we Americans have been wandering in the desert of catastrophe capitalism. And yet, no Moses, no promised land. If we in this desert would just to sit down and say that we have lost our way, perhaps we could admit a simple thing. We do not know what is needed for unity. Psalm 133, we read it. It may have warmed us somehow. How very good and pleasant when kindred dwell in unity. But that warming was not like seeing a familiar face. The unity of the church of those first apostles where all their wealth was held in common and distributed to each as any had need. This appears to us as a fantasy. We laugh, how long did that last? And we're right, it didn't last long. In the evening of the resurrection experiences, according to the evangelist John, the group is together for fear of persecution, and though they see their risen Lord and are filled with gladness, unity eludes them. Thomas will not join them. All these communities emerge from calamity. The Psalms were mostly written during the relentless catastrophe that followed the exile's return to Jerusalem from Babylon around 540 BC. Most of the songs come from their period that followed when their wealth was no longer theirs, their king was no longer theirs, their temple lay in ruins. Calamity, except, except this. There was revealed to them, the Judahites, came to be known as the Jews, there was revealed to them a new way of coming together, a new meaning for community. You all know the word synagogue. Do you know what it comes from in Greek? It means to grow up together, a new way of being community. The Psalms were sung into calamity as community emerged. Now, we hardly need add any color to the catastrophe of the crucified Lord that sat hard and heavy on the hearts of the disciples. And then, and then, in a mystery, calamity found them bound fast in communities that grew for decades to come. In a sense, the Bible is a hundred Maybe 400 stories of catastrophe turning into utterly unexpected beloved communities. Jacob at last meeting his feared brother Esau. Joseph meeting with his feared brothers. The rise of Samuel. Saul's demise, David's prize, Elisha's gift as Elijah dies, Job's cries to God, Jeremiah's, Ezekiel's command that the dry bones rise and come together. Paul and Silas joined with jailers in jail. If you don't know or read the Bible, maybe, maybe you'll take my word for it, that in here, beloved community comes from calamity. Not always, alas. 
The unexamined needs of humans are too many and too unruly for our kind always to do what's beautiful when privation collapses all around them. But far more than mere chance my direct community rises from ashes. In 2009, Rebecca Solnit, I'm sure the name is recognized by some, Rebecca Solnit published A Paradise in Hell, a book whose subtitle names what the book thoroughly explores, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster, Calamity from com and Community. Now put that book on your list. We're not going to review its many stories here, but they can kindle a flame. Let's ask this, though. What is the spiritual and psychological connection between calamity and renewed community? What has this to say to us who now live in what I call the untied states of America? When grievous loss befalls you or your society, when all that we count on crumbles apart, two, not three, not one, two roads diverge for that life. It is either misery or growth. Either misery or growth. This is a spiritual law. It governs what is not material, hence a spiritual law. It governs what cannot be tallied or possessed. It governs the matters of the heart. Ecclesiastes has it that God has put eternity in our mind yet so that we cannot guess from first to last what all that God has brought to pass. When this infinite imagination of ours is brought short by loss. It is a spiritual law that one option, one road, is misery. Everyone faces misery sometimes, and it has many faces. Addiction, denial, election denial, willful ignorance, cheating, lying, abuse, religious fanaticism, nationalism, racism, violence. All these forms of misery have in common a desperate craving to control what is coming with a rudder stuck in the mud of the past. But sometimes, sometimes, a soul is served through calamity. Sometimes, rather than fight for the past, the coming of calamity frees a person, even a whole society, from attachments to what seems settled and true. Now, people may have trodden paths of misery for a very long time when, of a sudden, like the prodigal son in that pigsty starving, suddenly they come to themselves, they awaken. They grasped that nothing on earth was promised, that nothing on earth can satisfy the eternity that God has placed in our mind. And nothing on earth can extinguish the eternal flame that burns in them as humble gratitude for the life we are given. A person can come to herself even while all the world is collapsing around her. Sometimes calamity sets the conditions for unity and community. The ancients who contributed their thoughts, their gifts to the Bible, did not set their stories down merely to evoke awe in all the following generations with proofs that once upon a time God did marvels. Bible stories do not prove anything. The ancients set these stories down because they themselves had come through calamity. 
from all their old truths, they themselves had been severed and yet somehow delivered into a new spirit of unity and community. For them, for anyone ready to grow, truth is then utterly transfigured. No more does truth take the form of words, true or false, as laws or threats to be obeyed or performed or executed. Truth becomes an event. From calamity, the event of community. That's an event. Something up till now not perceived is perceived. And no, the new perception is not the new truth to be imposed on whoever you can impose it on. It's not a new rule to be imposed. No, truth is the event. Only the event is truth. This is a very different way from hearing that word than anything that the West has taught on the subject for hundreds of years. This is why I believe why John's story gives to doubting Thomas the peak experience of the resurrection as an event up from calamity. My Lord and my God, he says. The story is set down to draw you and me toward the possibility of a new event of unconcealment, a new unity that was not perceptible before. It is your own experience of God. But now, alas, in vast numbers, our fellow citizens in this nation are more in misery in the spiritual sense than at any time in living memory. Is it too simple to observe that the illusions of capitalism and race supremacy have collapsed and sundered old truths and beliefs, and that so much of the religion out there is so saturated in materialist promises that misery is the only road those eyes of the flesh can see? However that may be, millions are ready, they say they're ready, to pollsters to see violence used to restore truths of the past and to impose these truths on all as God's own truth. Banning books, imprisoning teachers for telling the stories of slavery and Jim Crow or sexual orientation, punishing doctors for caring for women, judging and gerrymandering democracy into a corner so that it starved to death. You see this happening. It is how fear and misery respond to the open future, a future where old truths have gone to dust and the relations among classes and races and the sexes are no longer fixed. Yes, it looks like a hard rain going to fall. What is the way now for any who trust that truth comes only as an event of unity, a revealing of what had been hidden and never a whip to wield, nor a contraption for control. What is the way for us who will never make the road with violence? Who will not despair or choose misery, though things fall apart? Who will guard with our lives the precious hope that the only law be love? Who pray and stand and act so that that law alone might come again into the heart of the people as the active principle of democracy. What is the way for us now? This way of growth and not misery, in the world this way is weak. It bears no armor. It raises no weapon against anyone. This way does not expect the world will see our way, this way, as the right way. That binary, right and wrong, has gone. 
This way is the way of preparation for an unexpected event of community arising from calamity. Is calamity really coming? Go ask the climate. Yet for any on this way, the future lies open. We grow in our capacity to live without asserting that we know the truth. And we accept the astonishing fracture of reality for Americans according to which news media they attend to. We grow. The game of claiming we're right, you're wrong, no longer rewards our spirit as we live in expectation of an event, a revelation of new humanity. For love is the only law. I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible. Love is the only all, the only event, the only truth. In the epilogue of her book, Paradise and Hell, Rebecca Solnit writes, quote, preparation for disaster must make a society more like that of the disaster utopias told of in this book in their brief flowering, more flexible and improvisational, more egalitarian, with more room for meaningful roles for all members. In the margin I wrote, nice, but how? In the next paragraph, Solnit concludes, but this will never exist whole, stable, and complete. It is always coming into being. In the margin I wrote, exactly, truth as event. When Thomas puts his hand in the side of his Lord, most translations have it that Jesus responds with a somewhat scolding question. Have you trusted because you have seen me? The early manuscripts of the gospel do not support this translation. There is no indication that it was a question or is to be read as a question. Rather, a statement. You have trusted because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to trust. Could it be more plain that this was story was not written because it is true or because it happened? Maybe it did, but that would be too small a thing to say it happened, it happened, it happened. It's too small. This story was written for you and you and me, for any who hope to trust that no matter what calamity befalls by your formation in the body of Christ, which is the body of this sovereign and miserable world, you can pass through fire into community that God alone gives by the law of love, the event of love, the only truth. Three times. Paul writes in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, that he besought the Lord to relieve him of an affliction. But God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power made perfect in weakness. And then Paul continues, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong.